If you haven't already done the pretest, it's go.osu.edu slash bumble pre. So I'm so happy to have Dr. Karen Goodell with us this afternoon. She's a professor at The Ohio State University in uh, our um, uh, Newark campus where she teaches courses. She has lab work, uh, a lot of exciting field work, and also does a lot of outreach. Uh, uh, one of her research projects that I find so fascinating is out at the wilds. That's about a 10,000 restored uh, strip mine area out in um, kind of southeastern Ohio. It's actually part of the Columbus Zoo and Karen has for years had some research there studying pollinators, bee nesting, um, some of the remnant forest um, dynamics happening out there at the wilds. Uh, she was also the co-lead on the uh, our search for the rusty patch bumblebee here in Ohio, a two-year bumblebee survey with along with Dr. Randy Mitchell who will be here next week. Um, they together surveyed about, uh, um, had their eyes on about 23,000 bumblebees from across the state with their research teams um, out uh, surveying, didn't find the rusty patch, but found lots of other bumblebees, had a good sense of where um, those populations were across the state. And now her lab is heading um, an Ohio bee survey, trying to figure out who are the bees here in Ohio. We think about uh, 450 to 500 species, but we're not sure. So Karen's overseeing that project along with a specialist bee project here in the state. So Karen, so uh, happy to have you with us today to teach us about our uh, bumblebees of the Eastern North America. Thank you very much. Um, everybody, I hope, can hear me. And um, thank you, Denise, for inviting me to be here today. I'm really excited to talk to uh, people. Uh, I'm looking at the participants. We have over a thousand people, which is by far my biggest audience ever. And hopefully I can, I can deliver a talk that is exciting and also um, one that you can learn something. I'm sorry that some people were having trouble getting to the pretest. It's not super important. It was mainly for my own um, knowledge to see, you know, how much is it possible to teach a group of people about bumblebee ID to species in, in about an hour. So definitely I've never tried this before and certainly never done it over, over Zoom, but we are gonna give it a try. And I'm also floored to see so many people from so many different places. This is really great. Everybody from you know, Alaska to Maine to Georgia to Texas, and even some people from my own home county, Berkshire County, Massachusetts. So uh, welcome, everybody. I'm going to share my screen now, and hopefully this will work, and start my presentation. OK. Right, so this is the identification of bumblebees of the Eastern USA. Um, we have about 33 um, bumblebee species in the Eastern US. I won't be able to go over all of them. Some of them are quite rare and I have left them off my talk, but I'm gonna give you some resources. And Denise has also provided links to resources where you can look at, uh, learn all, all 33 species. So just to go over the goals of this um, hour that we have together, I, I'd like you to learn to distinguish bumblebees from, from other similar, similar looking insects. So that's the very first challenge. Um, learn the morphological traits that are used to identify bumblebees to species, um, usually without a microscope. There are some microscopic traits, but it's nice uh, for people who don't have microscopes to be able to make some headway on species IDs. Uh, to learn to identify the most common Eastern uh, bumblebees on the wing, uh, learn characters used to identify some of the more uncommon species, usually from photos. And then um, if we have time at the end, I'd like to present some of the results from a bumblebee survey that my lab did a couple of years ago um, in Ohio. So we can take some lessons from that. Just to start out, uh, bumblebee identification tools are growing in number. And I think probably the most um, comprehensive book for the Eastern or for all of North America would be Paul uh, Williams, Robin Thorpe, Leif Richardson and Sheila Cola have this really wonderful bumblebees of North America. So that's uh, not a free book, but it, it's definitely a really wonderful book. And kind of similar to that, but just for the East Coast is a free um, sort of small pamphlet 
that you can get, and we have a link to that on the uh, website that Denise provided. That's Bumblebees of the East, and that's spearheaded by uh, Sheila Koa, Leif Richardson, and Paul Williams. And I'll be drawing on some of the images from this book in my talk today. A lot of states um, and, and websites have little keys to bumblebees that are more regional. So this is one um, that you can find on bspotter.org um, for some of the Midwest states. So it's Missouri through Ohio. And this is a, a little, nice little pictorial key that's kind of fun to work through. Um, here's one for Minnesota bumblebees. Again, it's not really a key, but a pictorial guide to bumblebees. And that one is free as well. Um, Discover Life is always a wonderful resource for all different kinds of bee species, focusing, I think right now, more on the Eastern bees, um, but growing in its um, possibility for identifying Western bees. And there's a, a bumblebee identification link on this one. You go to ID Nature Guides right up here. Right, so just to kind of by way of introduction and to continue along the lines of things that were discussed uh, by Jamie Strange and Tam Smith in previous sessions. You know, why do we care so much about bumblebees? And these are some of the things that I note about bumblebees that make them really unique and special and, and really useful to humans. So in addition to being sort of the teddy bears of the insect world, they're these large bodied uh, organisms that can fly long distances, often in cooler and windier weather, which makes them able to pollinate plants under those conditions where other bees can't. Um, they're active from you know, quite a long season. So in the East, usually from April through October. And that's also unique among um, native bees. We don't have that many native bees that are active for that long. They have these special abilities to do uh, buzz pollination that Jamie Strange talked about by vibrating the anthers of plants and letting the pollen out. And you can see and hear this video online, but uh, this is one that I took. I don't know if the sound is really coming through or the visual, but um, that was a bumblebee uh, buzz pollinating the solanum flower. Um, they have some, they're social, so they can learn from their nest mates. They have the ability to learn complicated flowers and that's been demonstrated by experiments in labs. And they're especially good at pollinating some of our uh, crop plants that have these anthers that open in little pores like blueberries, cranberries, tomatoes, and peppers. So bumblebees are super important organisms for us to conserve and they're very unique, occupy a very unique niche in, um, in our natural environments. Oops. Um, one of my first goals was to make sure that when you're out in the field, you um, can distinguish what a bumblebee is from other insects. And um, is it a bumblebee or is it something mimicking a bumblebee is the question. Bumblebees are very um, hairy, so they're large. They have hairs all over their body, um, including on their abdomen. And the females of non-parasitic species will have these um, flattened corbiculae or pollen baskets. And so those are some of the very unique traits of bumblebees. Now there's lots of different, there's a couple of different kinds of mimicry where Batesian mimicry where um, harmless species will mimic harmful species like ones that can sting. So you'll see um, mimic, um, bumblebee mimics among hoverflies, beetles and moths, for example. Um, mimicking those stinging insects. And um, another form of mimicry that has evolved, Mullerian mimicry, in which groups of harmful species all um, evolve to look similar to each other, which helps their predators learn more quickly that they're all harmful. And so the wasps are a good example um, of ones that might be confused for a bumblebee. So um, just to go over some of these, um, if you're out in the field and you see things like this, um, these are flies in the family Acility, the, the uh, robber flies, they're predatory flies that are really hard to distinguish. I've actually caught some of these um, robber flies thinking they were bumblebees, but their behavior is quite different. You'll also note that they only have two wings instead of four and they have very tiny antennae. Um, this moth, a clear wing moth can look a little bit like a, bum a bumblebee visiting flowers, but they typically have a much longer proboscis and they have um, little scales on their wings, which if you look up close, bumblebees do not have those. This is a, um, a bombaleid fly, actually a bee parasite 
can be quite fuzzy like a bumblebee, but it will have um, only two wings instead of four. And um, there's another psyllid fly, very large eyes, very small antennae, and just two wings instead of four. So that's different from a bumblebee. And here's our bumblebee here. Um, uh, and you can see that this bumblebee has uh, four wings, one, two, three, four. It's got hair all the way down on its abdomen. And then non-bumblebees, uh, uh, bees that are not bumblebees is what I mean by that, um, that might be sort of part of a Mullerian mimicry complex, might include things like this Andrina, so this um, ground bee, these Osmia species, I would say that Osmia bucephala is really a dead ringer for a bumblebee when you see it just out of the corner of your eye. You want to note that it's got um, a very, very wide head, almost as wide or at least as wide as its thorax. And you'll see that bumblebees lack that feature. They also won't have any corbicular hairs. Um, there are a couple of species of solitary bee in the um, Anthophora and the Stilithrix bombiformes that are also very similar to bumblebees. Um, Tilithrix nests in the ground, um, as well as Anthophora. They have hairy hind legs. They don't have uh, corbiculae or pollen baskets. And Tilithrix is almost always associated with swamps and hibiscus flowers because it's a floral specialist. And then finally, the Xylocopa virginica, the um, Eastern carpenter bee. This one is probably the most commonly confused for a bumblebee. It has um, very large eyes, very hairy. The females have very hairy hind legs, so no corbicular hairs, um, and a kind of a much more shiny abdomen, unlike your bumblebees, which again have these very hairy abdomens and these flattened um, pollen baskets. So hopefully those are some characteristics that you can look for out in the field. I, I hope you see all of these bees while you're out in the field. They're all wonderful, um, but they are not bumblebees. Bumblebees um, uh, come in two, two sexes, like most insects, um, females, which include the queens and the workers and males. And the taxonomy or the traits are a little bit different between females and males. So it's useful if you're gonna try to ID one to know whether it's female or male. If you see a bee out there with pollen baskets or a sting, then it would have both, that's a female. Females also tend to have broader abdomens. Um, males, on the other hand, have relatively narrower and longer abdomens. They actually have a couple of extra abdominal segments. Um, they tend to have longer antennae, larger eyes. And um, in the east, one of the traits that I often use to kind of check to see if it's a male is if it has yellow hairs on its face. Now that won't work for every single species, but many, especially the most common species in the east, um, often will have yellow hair, males will have yellow hairs on their face, and that's a very uncommon trait for most of the common females in the East. Queens and workers can differ um, in their characteristics as well within a species, so it's useful to know if you have a queen or a worker. Also, um, you don't want to, want to kill a queen because she's the foundation for a whole colony, whereas workers are a little bit more expendable if you do need to euthanize one. Um, queens tend to be larger, and so there are really two things you want to look for with queens, how big they are. So here we've got 17 to 21 millimeters. This is a, a very general for, for bombus and patients anyway, the common eastern bumblebee. Whereas workers are much smaller, they're like 10 to 16. You can get queen size workers and occasionally you can get a smallish queen. So this, these are not um, always super clear. The other thing is there's a period of time and we happen to be just entering that time period during the season where queens are really the only bee, bumblebees that you will see. So this is the time for queens. It's a really good time to go out in the field and get a feel for what queens really look like around May or depending on the species June, you will start to see um, workers and males coming in. So that will give you a nice contrast. There's a lot of um, morphology in bees that are, is very useful for telling species apart, but not all of that is very visible without uh, magnification. So I'm gonna start here on this right-hand picture. 
Some of the things that you'll be looking at are, first of all, the color of the hairs on the abdomen. Bumblebees have these very distinctive color patterns. And usually when we, the, the, the segmented abdomen um, has uh, five or six or seven, depending on the gender um, or the sex of the species, we'll have these turgial segments. And we usually, we call these turgia, they're the abdominal segments. And we abbreviate that with a T. So T1 would be the most anterior abdominal segment. T2 would be the second most anterior and so forth. So you wanna be able to get a good look at the abdominal segments. Um, the thorax here, this middle section of the bee, um, the back of the thorax here, we've got the scutum and in behind that posteriorly, the scutellum. Those are nice uh, places to get a look. We've got the, the side of the thorax, called the pleura. Um, there's characters on the head, especially the very top of the head called the vertex. Oops, sorry about that. Um, you'll be looking for cor the corbiculum or corbiculi plural. That's on the hind leg only. And then sometimes wings are useful to see if they're darkened or very light um, that can correlate with species. Now there's plenty of characters on the face of bees, like how long their face is or how wide their face is, uh, how long the tongue is. This little malar space or this area between the eye and the mandible can be long or short. However, those are gonna be very difficult to see um, without magnification. So I'm gonna show you a series of slides like this one in which I've pulled some of the diagrams. Um, I think these were made by Elaine Evans and you can find them on um, Bumblebee Watch. So I've shamelessly copied them from Bumblebee Watch and I thank Elaine Evans for providing such clear figures. Um, and these you know, are Bumblebee caricatures. So they do show the most, some of the most common color patterns, um, but you need to be aware that there's quite a lot of variation in some species. And I'll point you toward the um, Cola et al. Book, uh, booklet for providing a little bit more detail about some of the color variations. And I'm gonna start with um, Bombus affinis or the rusty patched bumblebee because this is our federally endangered species. If you do see this one while you're out and about, definitely report it, get a picture up there. Um, this is a really um, important species, at least um, for some areas, we haven't seen this in a very, very long time. And I happen to live in one of those states where we haven't seen it for many years. Um, I know some of you are in areas that have a little bit more of the rusty patch bumblebee. So I'll go through these characters, um, um, starting with the head, then the thorax and abdomen. So the rusty patch bumblebee, the first thing you wanna notice looking at these diagrams are that the head has black hairs on it. And if you look at some of these specimens, you can see that there, there really aren't um, yellow hairs up there on that top of the head, sort of behind the eyes, the vertex. Um, the thorax of the rusty patch bumblebee is black, or is yellow, I'm sorry, but it tends to have a little black spot or sometimes a little tack shaped um, uh, spot. So we've got the queen here on the left and a worker here shown on the right. Um, the pleura or the sides of the thorax of the rusty patch are yellow, mostly yellow hairs. And then we get to the abdomen, which is where the famous rusty patch is. So the abdominal um, segments on the workers are yellow. And then the second abdominal segment, the T2, has a, uh, often has a rusty central band here that can look nice and bright like this, but if you get an old specimen, it might be a little bit more faded. So be aware that that bright orange doesn't necessarily stay throughout an individual's whole life. So where it says W only, I mean workers only. And then the hind um, sections, the posterior sections of the abdomen um, are all black on the rusty patch bumblebee. Now notice that the queen, unfortunately does not have that rusty patch. So she's gonna be a little bit harder to distinguish from some of our other species. So if you do see a queen that's got two full abdominal segments, T1 and T2 of yellow, you wanna really pay special attention. These tend to be out very early in the season. So I imagine they're getting ready to emerge if not already emerged now. 
Now I'm going to move to probably our most common uh, bumblebee species in the east. This is a, extremely common and it is increasing in, in its relative abundance anyway. This is Bombus impatiens, the common eastern bumblebee. And this is a very distinctive bee. Um, and I think that probably the most distinctive thing is it's, it's one of the few species that has just one segment of the abdomen ye yellow, and that's the T1 segment. All the other segments are typically black. It does have a little bit of yellow on its vertex, and it will sometimes have some mixed um, uh, black and yellow hairs on the on its um, thorax, on the top of its thorax there, a little black spot. Um, it's uh, the queens come out um, very early and the workers are around very late in the season and get extremely common. There's a lot of variation in size. You can find a bumblebee worker that is almost as big as a, a, a common Eastern bumblebee queen. And you can find tiny little workers that are smaller than honeybees. So it's extremely variable in size, really depends on how much these individuals are fed. Another extremely common bee in the East is the brown belted bumblebee. And I probably should have juxtaposed this one right up against um, the rusty patch bumblebee because this one also features a little rust colored band but you can probably already tell that that little rust colored band is different because it's surrounded on the on the posterior side with black hairs rather than yellow hairs so the rusty patch bumblebee would be yellow on on t2 the brown belted bum bumblebee is uh, black and rust colored on t2 so you pretty get, can get pretty excited about seeing that rusty patch on the brown belted bumblebee, but you wanna look down beyond that to see what, what comes after that. And if it's black, then you've got a, a brown belted. If it's yellow, then you can still remain really excited. They've also got a, a completely black head. Um, so no yellow hairs on their vertex. They've got yellow on their pleura or on the size of their thorax. They tend to have a black spot on their thorax. And sometimes these sort of dark, dusky wings. The, um, the queens and, and, and newly emerged workers have this trait of being very um, short, even hairs. And you can kind of see it on some of these slightly blurry pictures here on this male. They, they're very clean and neat looking. And this is a feature that's kind of interesting about the, um, the brown belted bumblebee that when you when you see a bee that's just very clean and well groomed looking that uh, that has a rusty patch that's very likely to be um, the brown belted bumblebee. Sometimes the brown belt doesn't show up very well, especially in queens, and you can see that that would be replaced with just sort of a yellow area here. And I'm going to talk now about the the third probably most common bumblebee species in the east, which is Bombus bimaculatus. And of course, by the east, I'm heavily influenced by my work in Ohio. So I recognize that in some areas, maybe up further north, up in New England or down south, you might not have the same relative abundances of bees. The um, Bombus bimaculatus is sometimes hard to tell from um, from uh, Bombus grusiacalis, the brown belt. It, its second abdominal segment has these two yellow spots on it that almost look like a little W, um, but that can be blurred sometime. If you notice this queen, she looks a little dusky and um, it almost looks like a little half moon. This worker also, it's hard to tell that that's really two spots. It almost looks like a little half moon, um, but they don't tend to have any, any um, uh, sort of rust colored pile on them. Their thorax is yellow. They tend to have this uh, black spot in the middle of their thorax. Um, their uh, third through fifth abdominal segments are, a little, are all black, um, for workers anyway. And um, 
Males are extremely variable. So if you look up here at this male, it seems to have yellow hair sort of all over its body. Um, so it can have little yellow stripes down on um, T4 sometimes or on T3 and sometimes on the underside of its body. They tend to be um, a highly variable. The workers are much more consistent in their coloration. Let's see. Another thing that's interesting about Bombus bimaculatus is they're a very early species. So actually we found our first Bombus bimaculatus in Columbus, uh, in the Columbus area just this week. And uh, I haven't seen any other bumblebee queens yet myself. By August, you're pretty much seeing the very end of Bombus uh, bimaculatus. They don't really continue into August very much. And um, by September, October, they, they will really not be around at all. Maybe a few males here and there, but the cycle is, is shifted a little bit earlier. Hopefully I'm not going too fast, but I do have a break in here for questions and can go back to anything that anybody has a question on. Um, the golden northern bumblebee. This is another pretty distinctive bee, Bombus fervidus. Um, this bee is uh, very, very yellow. Um, it has a black head. It's got a thorax that is mostly yellow, but it has this distinct black band. And so rather than a spot, it's sort of a, a straight band going across. This is at least true for the, the queens and workers. Sometimes I've seen males that have more of a spot of uh, a yellow in the thorax. But what's really distinctive about the golden northern bumblebee is it has four complete uh, abdominal segments, one through four, they're all yellow. Um, the fifth um, and in males, the sixth abdominal segments are gonna be black. So here we've got a queen, a worker and a male and you can see that they're pretty consistently all yellow all the way across. They also tend to have dark wings and if you do get a look at their face or their tongue, they've got a very long face and a very long tongue. And they tend to visit flowers that some of the shorter tongued bumblebee species can't access very well, like crimson clover, um, big red clover flowers. You'll see them visiting those. And sometimes some of the other bumblebees um, with shorter tongues can't get, get their tongues all the way down to the nectar in those flowers. So this bee species, some, there have been some publications that suggest that we have fewer of them now than, than we used to. And that's a, a source of concern. And um, for right now, they're not listed as in danger, but it's certainly a species to watch and a species of interest. We wanna kind of keep track of where and, and how many golden Northern we are seeing. Now I am going to um, delve into some of the bumblebee species um, that are technically of Eastern North America and get into the Eastern US um, that have either a pretty Northern or a pretty Southern distribution. And for those, I've provided little maps that I downloaded um, yesterday from Iowa, showing you where people are finding these. Um, Bombus borealis, the Northern Amber bumblebee. I've actually never seen this in the wild myself. So um, maybe not super qualified to talk about it, However, we did find it in our Ohio bumblebee survey. We had one specimen up around Lake Erie. So certainly you want to look out for this bumblebee. Um, this is one that uh, defies my, my rule of thumb that females don't tend to have yellow hairs on their faces. So if you see something that looks like this, you don't wanna just grab it thinking it's a male because the females can have yellow hairs on their faces. Um, like the uh, golden northern bumblebee, they tend to have a black band between their wings on their thorax. And um, if you look right here, you can see the side of the thorax is all black, giving it a very dark look. Um, the abdominal segments um, T1 through 4 are all yellow, and sometimes T5 is also yellow. So they, they have a very um, yellow abdomen. They're very long tongued. And again, they have this very Northern um, distribution here. So you might be wondering how in the world am I ever gonna tell this from a, um, a Bombus fervidus, the golden Northern bumblebee. So I provided this little trick here. Golden Northern bumblebees um, do not have yellow hairs on their face, not the females anyway. 
And if you look here at the side of their thorax, they have yellow hairs, right? So this one has black hairs right here. Um, so the pleura is yellow in the golden northern and black in the northern amber bumblebee. And also some of the pictures that I've seen of them anyway, they look the yellow, the quality of the yellow color is a little different, a little um, sort of richer, almost more orangey yellow, whereas these tend to be a, a much lighter sort of baby yellow color. The black and gold bumblebee, one of my favorite bumblebee species uh, that's quite common in Ohio um, at certain times of the year anyway, is a very interesting species. It's, it's extremely large. It has um, a little bit of yellow, always has a little bit of yellow on, it, on its vertex, maybe not very much, but a little bit, and that's gonna be an important trait to remember. It has a thorax that is, um, has quite a lot of black on it in the middle here. So it's not a black band, it's, it's really quite a lot of black all the way down sort of into the scutellum area behind the wing bases. Its pleura are all black, so it's quite dark on the sides of its thorax. It has dark wings, giving it also a very sort of dark appearance. Typically the, the abdomen of these, um, Black and gold bumblebees are also, they have the first abdominal segment is often quite black. It will sometimes have some yellow on it, um, but other times not. So that's a, a, a variable. T2 and three are almost always entirely yellow. So that gives it much more striped appearance. And the posterior segments, the uh, four and five tend to be black on this species. So it's sort of got a a very sort of striped sort of banded appearance. I have never seen a small worker of Bombus oricomus. Um, they are always, almost always queen size to the ones that I've collected and that I've seen. This may not be true throughout its range, but I think of this as a quite a large species, both um, the queens and the workers. And the other interesting thing is that they are really getting started quite late. So mid to late summer, the queens are coming out in May and June. You don't tend to get a lot of workers until July. I often see them in association with uh, Monarda, although I haven't really been able to demonstrate this um, quantitatively from our surveys. It's kind of a hard thing to pull out. But if you have a big patch of this bee balm here, um, you're quite likely to find these if you're in their range. And a very, very similar species is the American bumblebee. So these two species, we often have a hard time training people to identify in the field, um, one from the other. This is also a large sort of later season bumblebee, sort of mid to late summer. Um, its head and face are all black. And I've underlined that to remind me to tell you that you will not see any yellow on the vertex of an American bumblebee. So up here on the top of its head, sometimes um, the, the previous bumblebee, the black and gold will look like it has little eyebrows, like little yellow eyebrows, uh, almost little yellow lines it can be very subtle. You won't find that on the American bumblebee. And that's one of the traits that um, I use in the field to distinguish these. But like the um, this species, like the previous one, can be a little bit variable in its, in its color patterns. So here I've got the thorax, um, tends to be all black posteriorly, um, whereas the previous one had a little bit of yellow on the back of its thorax. Um, the pleura are all black, just like the black and gold bumblebee. Its wings also very dark. And its abdomen, again, T1 can be either yellow or black, and sometimes a mix of the two. T2 and 3 are almost always yellow, and the back part of its thorax um, tends to be all black. And males um, are similar, but you can see this male here has yellow on the posterior part of its thorax a little bit of yellow on its face. So again, 
I wouldn't feel bad if you can't tell these two species apart. The, the differences are quite subtle. They're both quite large species. They're in similar habitats. Um, I can talk a little bit more about sort of some of the differences we found in their distribution relative to Ohio. They both tend to prefer to be in grasslands um, and, you know, are really not, you don't tend to see a lot of workers in Ohio anyway until sort of midsummer. This is also a species that is, appears to be in decline. It, it has been extremely widespread and common in the United States, but there's evidence that it has lost um, distribution um, over a big part of its range. So um, we see this quite frequently, but I know that it is, appears to be disappearing from much of its, from parts of its range. And um, this is problematic. It's been petitioned for the, um, to be federally endangered and it's under review now. Right, so this is my break for questions. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions right now. And I, while you're thinking of your questions, I'll just uh, point out these bees. We've got a uh, common Eastern bumblebee. And this is actually also a common Eastern bumblebee, which reminds me to tell you that Sometimes you can get very unusual color patterns and it seems to be not that hard for a bumblebee like a common Eastern to develop with a little bit of orange hairs on its abdomen. And um, I don't know a whole lot about the science behind this, but I know, I know that these color patterns have to do with Hox genes and um, sort of these body, body patterning genes. So maybe small mutations and and a gene can give you a very dramatically different looking color pattern. But um, we've often, or not often, but fairly regularly find a couple of these common Eastern bumblebees with orange hair on their abdomen. But nope, the only yellow hair you have here is on the first abdominal segment. Thanks, Karen. So while you have um, that, that worker up there, there were a couple questions in the Q&A box about the size of workers um, and kind of what causes that or what influences that and how that may change through the season. So maybe you could address that. Um, the size of workers. Okay. So am I, okay. I, I, am I not supposed to read the questions myself? So Oh, sorry. Um, so yeah, I can, I can field them for you if you want to field some too, either way. Yeah. So that's a really interesting question. So in many of these species, the size of the worker is going to depend on how much food they get as a larva. And that can be environmentally determined, or it might have to do with the ontogeny, you know, the ontogenetic stage of the colony. Um, as I mentioned, the common Eastern bumblebee, I have seen them everywhere from these tiny little bees, they're about the size of a large andrina uh, or a, a, you know, a little smaller than a honeybee, all the way up to almost the size of a queen bumblebee. So it's a huge range. And I know there are some um, ecologists and evolutionary biologists uh, and bee biologists working on sort of the significance of body size and workers. I think that's a really fascinating line of research, but I, I think we're just beginning to understand you know, how this, you know, is this an adaptive thing or is it um, something that just is sort of a result of food shortages? You know, would they all be big if they could? And then you'll get species like the, um, the black and gold bumblebee, um, Bombus oricomus, and the American bumblebee, Bombus pennsylvanicus, where I really have never seen a small worker. So there may be something about just how those um, bumblebees are living, maybe the time of year during the midsummer where it's not advantageous to make a worker unless you can make it large. And I really don't know why we don't see anything very small. I've seen very tiny um, uh, go uh, golden northern bumblebees and I've seen large, um, large ones too. So those tend to have a, a very big range in size. Um, the, the brown belt and the two spot bumblebee also tend to vary quite a bit in the, in the size. So I, I wish I had a better answer for you. <laughs> I don't know how many questions you wanna take. Do you wanna take one about um, uh, ways to photograph to get those characteristics in? 
I, I would love to um, wait until the end for that because I actually have a whole little section on photography or it's a very tiny section on photography. Awesome. Um, and then there are a couple of queen questions and I'll bet you might want to wait for those too. Possibly, I'm not sure how much I'm going to go into queens. Um, I see somebody talking about Batesian versus Mueller and mimicry, which I threw in because I, I think it's a very interesting subject and I teach biology a lot, but it doesn't have much to do with identification. Um, and I think what you're getting at here is whether uh, Margot Hicks, whether they're harmful or harmless, um, it's, it's really how harmful they are to their potential predators that that determines whether it's Batesian or, or Mullerian. So things that are able to sting or venomous, um, there's an, there might be an advantage for um, on something that is not venomous to be able to mimic something that is venomous to, you know, trick their predators. Yeah. Um, and just maybe to clarify, I, um, there was a question about how many abdominal segments the females have with six versus males with the seven. Um, I think you misspoke in one of them. So um, I'm, that's quite possible. And I apologize. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Is there any other burning questions? Um, there are a lot of range. I don't want to take you too far astray. Climate change having an impact on phenology between bumblebees and flowers, they require to survive. Uh, one of the neat things about bumblebees is they're highly generalized in their foraging, which makes sense because they have a very long life cycle. Um, most of the research that I have read on sort of matches and mismatches between bees and their floral resources having to do with climate warming suggests that there, we, we aren't finding very big um, shifts in, in sort of the flower resources and the bees that use them. And I'm not sure how much that would be really a problem for bumblebees anyway, um, because they are so highly generalized in their foraging. How much bee balm is enough to get for the black and gold bumblebee? Um, that's a great question. You know, a, a, a big patch of it might attract them, um, but it, you know, there are other things that bumblebees need uh, in order to survive. And one of the things about the black and gold bumblebee that I've noticed, and you'll see from um, the results of our research, is that they tend to be associated with open fields. And I think they're nesting out in these open fields and grasslands. So they would also need sort of access to good nesting habitat um, in order to you know, take advantage of any patch of bee balm. <laughs> Sally Adams says she once saw a bumblebee with a bright blue spot on the rear of its head. What might that be? Um, that might be pollen that you might, it might have been visiting a plant that has blue pollen, or you might be looking at a bee that a researcher has been painting um, so they can identify it. Okay, so I think maybe I should move on to make sure I have time for everything and try to get back to some of those questions. And if there are kind of groups of questions that I can answer at the end, that would probably be good. Okay. So, do I have control, Denise? Oh, there we go. Okay. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna move on to some species. We're kind of starting to get into some of the harder species here. And um, the name of this species suggests that it's gonna be a hard one. Um, the confusing bumblebee, Bombus perplexus. Um, this is a bee that you um, is not super uncommon, but it's not really one of our most common ones. Um, these tend to have a little bit of yellow on their head. 
um, males will have a face that's yellow, so you can see these pictures of males. And the thorax of the um, of the confusing bumblebee tends to be um, all a yellow here, so you don't tend to get a lot of black hair. It's got yellow on the sides of its thorax. Things get a little dicey in the um, in the ab. So T1 and 2 are almost always yellow. T3 can be black or yellow or a com combination of black and yellow. You do tend to get T5 being mostly black. One of the sort of gestalt um, features of this bee is that it tends to look a little scruffy. Um, it's not a real clean yellow look. It tends to have sort of uneven looking hairs, like it just got out of bed in the morning. It's a very highly variable species. And you can see, oops, I was gonna flip to that in a second. You, you'll see from the next slide um, that there are a lot of different color morphs. The males tend to have a little bit more yellow on their abdomen than the females most more frequently. So here are some pictures. This is from the Cola Richardson and Williams um, pamphlet. And you can see that um, we, here we've got the queens, um, Mostly T1 and T2 are, are yellow. Sometimes that extends into T3. Here we've got a queen that's got a little bit of white hair on T5. The workers also can be a little bit variable in how much yellow they have. But again, that thorax tends to be all yellow. And then the males are a little bit all over the place. So they can be almost all yellow with a yellow face, or they could be yellow with a little bit of black intermixed at, on their tails or they can have a black tail. Um, if you do get up close and personal with a Bombus perplexus, one thing you might notice is sort of round, sort of almost squared off face. That's um, very common of this bee and could help you distinguish it from other similar bees. But yeah, this is a, a very confusing bumblebee. A bee that you might confuse it with would be um, Bombus vegans, the half black bumblebee. And I think this half black name refers to the fact that the abdomen has two segments of completely of yellow and um, the rest are black. And that's a fairly consistent characteristic of this bee. It tends if you, on the face to have a slightly longer face. Um, it's got a little bit of um, uh, yellow on its vertex. You can see on this specimen up here, the little yellow hairs sticking out right there. I think of this as a, a pretty small bumblebee. Even the queens are relatively small and it is associated with forest. Um, so it tends to do well in slightly more forested landscapes, although it will certainly forage out in the open. In comparison to Bombus perplexus, which also tends to be associated with forested landscapes, it has a longer, so the, this half black bumblebee has a longer face. I would say it's often smaller. And notice that its thorax has a nice black spot right there, which you probably would not see in the confusing bumblebee. So I'm doing a bunch of species here that have the first and second abdominal segments yellow, so you can compare them one against the other. Bombus sandersoni, um, the Sanderson bumblebee, if you find this one, I would really like to know. Um, this is a particularly uncommon species. We don't know a whole lot about it and they're very hard to identify. So um, again, I, I always say if you find bumblebees with two abdominal segments yellow, you, you, you know you've already got something pretty interesting. You don't have one of the most common species. So this one has a, a, a black face um, or yellow face. It has a short tongue and its thorax can be yellow or yellow with a little black um, spot between the wing bases. T1 and 2 almost always yellow. T3 and four are black, but T5 can sometimes have a yellow or white band. And so you really wanna look out at the tails of your bumblebees to see if they have any evidence of yellow hairs down there, because um, that most certainly will lead you to a somewhat interesting bumblebee. So you can see it's pretty subtle on this um, image here. It's not always that easy to see. 
but really worth trying to get a good look at the tail. They tend to be small bodied and late emerging. They emerge in May. And again, very uncommon. So for comparison, um, we found a single individual of this species in our Ohio um, bumblebee survey. I don't think they're um, very common in Ohio at all, or um, don't tend to show up in, in many bumblebee surveys. And this is uh, this next bee also is an uncommon uh, bumblebee in becoming less common depending on where you live. This is the yellow banded bumblebee, um, Bombus terricola. So this bee um, has a black vertex. So it's, its head is all black. Its thorax um, has yellow anteriorly and black posteriorly. This first abdominal segment tends to be black. And then it's got two yellow abdominal segments, T2 and 3. And then we'll often have a, yellow, a little yellow on its tail. So T5 with a little bit of yellow or white pile right here. You can see that here. And that is true for queens workers and, and often males as well. So this is a, a really um, nice species. I have seen these in the wild before, but I happened to be in Vermont when I saw them. Um, some of the studies that have come out recently suggest that they're moving more northward or up into higher elevations. They seem to be responding to um, climate warming, perhaps. Um, there have been some sightings of these in Ohio near Lake Erie. So if you live up in northern Ohio, you want to keep a, keep a lookout for these. So we're especially interested in the, in the yellow-banded bumblebee. This one was petitioned for the endangered species list, but uh, ultimately, they decided that it was still common enough that it didn't warrant federal listing. But I would consider this rare and, and probably declining species. And I think if you do find one or a putative yellow banded bumblebee, people will be very interested to know that. Um, Bombus fraternus, the Southern Plains bumblebee. So here I provided a map because this one doesn't occur much in what I would consider to be the sort of central Midwest area. It has a more Southern distribution and out into the, the Great Plains states. So it gets up North more in the, in the prairie states there. Um, I have never seen this species in the wild, the Southern Plains bumblebee. So um, because I haven't collected in, in many of these areas. This species has a, has a black head, it tends to be a fairly um, large species. It has a thorax, again, with that nice black band between the, the wing bases, but otherwise yellow. It's pleura, so the sides of its thorax are yellow. It's got two yellow segments on its abdomen, and then the rest of its abdomen is black. So that's um, a common feature that we've seen. But this one tends to have these dark wings, um, a very round sort of short face. And this is another one like um, the black, the brown belted bumblebee that is, it has a very neat looking appearance. So if you look at some of these photos here, you can see how well groomed it looks like it's just been to the barber. Um, and that's uh, a characteristic of this uh, bumblebee species that comes from having very short, even pile or hairs. It's a very neat and tidy bee. Um, again, with those very dark wings. And to me, it has sort of the, the look of a, um, a black and gold bumblebee or a, a, an American bumblebee, not the same color pattern, but um, sort of a large size and those dark wings, a, a sort of sturdy looking bee. Bombus um, ternarius, the tricolored bumblebee. Um, here's one I'm providing a map for. You can see this definitely has a more northern distribution in the United States. So if you're lucky enough to live in these areas, this might be a very common bumblebee in your area. And to me, it's an extremely beautiful uh, species with its very striking color pattern. It's got a black um, hairs on its, um, on its head, but sometimes the vertex can be yellow. So you may have got a few yellow hairs up there in the vertex. Um, short-tongued, uh, relatively short-tongued for a bumblebee. Um, 
it has a very interesting thorax pattern. So mostly yellow on the thorax, but notice it has this sort of wedge shape pointing backwards, almost like a big thumbtack. Um, it has a fun uh, abdomen here with the T1 is yellow, T2 and 3 are this sort of orange, bright orange color. T4 is yellow, and then T5 is black. So this is a very sort of aposematic coloration, sort of warning coloration that is uh, quite striking. Um, and I've seen these in the field and they really do look as beautiful as these pictures. They're just gorgeous little bumblebees. Um, the hair is short, it's very neat and tidy again. Um, and they can be quite variable in size. So I've seen very, very small ones and slightly larger ones, examples of this species. So um, that would be the tricolored bumblebee. And here we've got orange that is sandwiched in between yellow, kind of like the uh, rusty patch bumblebee, but it's a much bigger orange patch. So, and that tack shaped, um, thumbtack shaped black spot would be a little bit bigger and a little bit different than the um, rusty patch bumblebee. A, a fourth species with red pile would be the red belted bumblebee. Here's another of our more northern distributions. And um, again, this one is cross continental. So you get all the west coast, all the way to the east coast. I have never seen this one in the field. Um, it would be very unusual to get this down as far as Ohio, although they may occasionally get down here. Um, the red belted bumblebee has, uh, the females have an abdomen where in T2, they have a little bit of uh, sort of bright red or bright orangey red hairs. Um, and T2 can, in some of them can also have a crescent of yellow hairs. So they're kind of a red morph and a black morph. Um, both of those can, can occur. So these might be a little bit confusing to identify. If you get a black morph, you can expect to have um, T3 is, is sort of black, and then you start up with the yellow again on T4. If you get the red morph, T3 would be more reddish, and then T4 would be yellow. Um, this is another fairly short-haired bumblebee species with a very round face. Um, and Again, with these different color morphs, it's quite highly variable. So I would refer you to um, the Paul Williams book or the Sheila Cola um, Bumblebees of Eastern North America to see some of the different color variations of this species. This one alert emerges later in the season in, in May um, and it has this more northerly distribution. Different from the tricolored bumblebee, right? So. The tricolored bumblebee, remember, has that sort of tack-shaped, um, wedge-shaped black uh, spot in the middle of its thorax. And this one would have more of a round little spot, a much more subtle black spot of hair on its thorax. Cork here, great. So Bombus citrinus is the lemon cuckoo bumblebee. This is the only um, parasitic social parasite bee that I decided to include in this presentation. Um, many of these species are quite rare, but um, the lemon cuckoo bee is fairly common through much of the uh, East and Midwest. Again, it's a social parasite, which means that the, the female queens they will invade the nest of another bumblebee species, suppress the queen, lay their own eggs. So they will lay female and male eggs that they will get their host colony to take care of. Um, all of the female lemon cuckoo bee eggs will grow up to be new queens that will get to um, inf go and uh, parasitize other bumblebee nests and the males, um, will get fed and then they'll go off and mate with other lemon cuckoo bees. So in that way, they, they don't really need corbiculae and they don't have corbiculae because they don't collect any pollen. They make their host colony do all the pollen collection. Um, so this is a quite a color 
variable species. I struggled a little bit trying to find pictures to show all these color variants. Um, they have no worker cast, so they're all about the same size. Uh, they have a little bit of yellow on their head. They have a yellow thorax. The ones that I personally have seen in the field tend to be like this left-hand bee. So they have a yellow thorax. They've got a mostly black abdomen, but T3 has a usually a yellow, um, a little bit of yellow banding on it. Um, you can get more yellow forms um, that uh, some of the males are often a little bit more yellow and those will look a little bit like this. I think this uh, male here showing T1 and T2, those are some intermixed yellow and black hairs. So again, a fairly highly variable species. You wanna look for females with a wide abdomen that lack um, pollen carrying structures. And that might suggest that you have a social parasite bumblebee. The other thing about the Bombus citrinus is they're almost a little bit like a carpenter bee in the fact that their abdomen tends to be a little bit less hairy and a little bit more shiny. So that's something else that you can look for um, in the lemon cuckoo bee. Okay. So those are the bee species that I chose to include in this presentation. Um, probably, I figured that probably including any more would lead to serious amounts of confusion. It's hard to remember even probably the ones that I have presented if this is your first time really going through them in detail. Um, when you're out in the field, you often get a chance to kind of observe a bee while it's sitting on a flower. And this slide is my guide to where you wanna look first. You do get a few seconds while it's on that flower. You wanna first look at the abdomen and really note the color pattern. You wanna note whether it has pollen baskets. Um, sometimes they'll be very obvious like this one where they have pollen in them, or they could be like this one where there's no pollen in them, but you just see that sort of shiny flattened area where it's sort of excavated with the hairs um, forming the basket around it. So that will tell you you've got a female and it's a non-parasitic species. Other things you wanna note, whether, you know, what's the form of a black spot or no black spot on the thorax? What color is the top of the head here, the vertex? And if you get a really good look at it, uh, what, what the um, pleura or the, um, you know, under the wing base is, what color of hair does it have there? And those are some of the things that you really wanna just automatically get used to noticing when you're looking at a bumblebee, because that will help you get through some of the um, guides and keys that are available to you to use to identify it. Photo photo uh, photography is a really wonderful way to um, share bumblebee uh, information and crowdsourcing your identifications is a nice way to learn your bumblebees. And I can recommend a couple of um, different places to do that. And I may be speaking to people who already are, are, are doing these um, photo-based, web-based um, uh, identifications in, in these naturalist communities. iNaturalist is one of my favorites. Um, you can make an account at iNaturalist.org. Um, if possible, if, if you don't mind uh, the slight lack of privacy, allowing people to see the locality where you take your photos makes them more useful uh, from a scientific point of view because we can pinpoint locations. If you don't provide, let the locality be known. It's nice to see you know, a, a bumblebee, but it's not quite as useful because we don't know where it was. So it might not be um, used in a scientific study. If you do join iNaturalist, there are various projects uh, on bees that you can join. Uh, the ones that I've been involved with, the Ohio Bee Atlas and the Ohio Bumblebee Atlas. Um, and you can actually join these projects and your observations will get automatically logged um, into their um, databases so that individuals that are following those projects can jump in and start identifying the bees. And there are quite a lot of bee specialists that spend a fair amount of time identifying bees on, on iNaturalist. 
And Bumblebee Watch is also a wonderful database and that is mostly being monitored by a group of scientists. So a little bit unlike iNaturalist where anybody can post an identification, uh, Bumblebee Watch, you know that your bees are being identified by experts. And so in that way, um, it is, um, you, know, you can really be about as sure as you can that the ID is correct. Um, and those are also been important uh, databases for scientific um, scientific studies on bumblebee uh, populations. And then bugguide.net is a slightly different kind of community, but they also um, can post things and experts will identify them there for you. So those are some options for crowdsourcing your identifications. Um, this picture here is the Ohio Bee Atlas, and this is the Bumblebee Watch website. When you go to photograph your bees, um, you want to try to get as many of the characters that are important for identification in your photographs. And many of these sites will allow you to upload multiple photographs of the same individual. But you, know, you can see from my examples here, this one on the left would not be a very good photo for identifying the bee. Why not? Well, you really can't see what's going on in the abdomen. You know, you might want to say that this is a Bombus impatiens, the common eastern bumblebee, but it could be um, a brown belted or it could be a, um, a two spot bumblebee because you can't really see the back of the abdomen. You can't see the top of the thorax uh, and it's a little hard to see the, the vertex as well. So you're missing some of the really key characteristics. If you go over here to the left or, or sorry, to the right, you can see this bumblebee, this is a really nicely photographed bumblebee. You can, um, you can see the two spots right here. So that's your two spot bumblebee. You can see the total, the whole abdomen, get a really good look at the thorax and the vertex. Um, it's a little hard to see if it has pollen baskets. So it might be hard to know if you've got uh, a male or a female, but in this case, because we know this species, males look a little bit different. This is probably a female bee. Okay. Um, you want to try not to cast shadows, um, get them in focus, of course. Um, and there are different ways that you can do this. Um, you don't necessarily need the most fancy camera. Um, a, a famous photographer once said, the best camera to use is the one that you have, right? And um, that's often our cell phones. And if that's what you have with you all the time to document things, and that's really gonna be your best camera. Um, you can photograph bees in nets. You can catch them in little vials or in mason jars. Um, some people do even use plastic Ziploc bags to catch things in and photograph them. If you chill them down a little bit, um, if you have that capability, they move slower and you can get maybe a better picture. But one idea is if you've got a bee that's pretty mad, doesn't like being in the jar and it's buzzing away, very active, you could take a short video of that bee and then later go back and choose a frame where you have the characteristics um, that are useful in focus or choose a couple of frames that have different characteristics in focus. So I like, I like that video idea because it could ensure that you, you know, could make the difference between an identifiable specimen and one that's not identifiable. So th those are my days. I have a couple more slides. Um, I see we're almost getting to the end and I I'll just kind of run through these to show you some of the results that we found from our bumblebee survey that we completed in Ohio in 2017 and 2018. And then I'll answer as many of the questions as I can. Um, this bumblebee survey was funded by the Ohio Department of Transportation in response to the, um, the rusty patch bumblebee being federally listed. They needed to know whether we had it and if we did, where we and what its habitat was. Um, I set out with Randy Mitchell, um, who you'll, I think later in this series, there's Randy and uh, Jesse Novotny, who was a postdoc on this project. Here's Denise, she was part of it as well. And Paige Rear, who was Randy's graduate student. And we were asking what bumblebees live in Ohio, whether we have the rusty patch bumblebee, 
and wanted to know what the geographic and, and habitat distributions of Ohio's bee species were. We really wanted to learn at the species level how are bees distributed across Ohio, which means that we needed to make a lot of bumblebee observations because we have a lot of different species, but not all of them are very common. And to get a chance of having enough observations of some of these rare species to really be able to say anything, we had to observe a lot of bumblebees. And I think by the end of two years, we had 24,000 observations. And even then we felt like we were sort of borderline with having enough data to say anything about some of these individual species that were quite rare. This is just sort of a, uh, a summary of, of, of what we found. So going from common to very uncommon, um, we have sort of these first three here that were quite common, the common Eastern bumblebee, the brown belt, and the two spot bumblebee. Um, we've got the golden Northern bumblebee. So, so sort of in the next sort of echelon of commonness, we've got um, the golden Northern bumblebee, the half black bumblebee, the black and gold bumblebee and the American bumblebee, as well as the confusing bumblebee. Pretty rare um, what was the social parasite, the, the lemon cuckoo bee, and we did not find any, sadly, any rusty patch bumblebees. But there are a couple of other species that, that we didn't uh, find. We, we actually did find one Bombus borealis and one Bombus sandersoni. Um, but all of these other species are ones that might have been here, um, but we didn't actually get to see. Since we have done this survey, somebody has found Bombus terricola, the, um, the yellow banded bumblebee in Ohio. So how common are these species? I said we have sort of what I call the big three in patients, Grizzia collis and bimaculatus. So it's common Eastern, brown belted and two spot. And this is sort of our overall distribution. Half of our 24,000 bees were the common Eastern bumblebee and 30% um, were the brown belt, 14% were the two spot and tiny percentages were made up by all of the other species. So most of, you know, if you're looking for bumblebees in this area, mostly what you're gonna see is probably these three. When you see something different, be assured that you're seeing something rather unusual. These relative abundances change over the season. So if you're looking in June, you're much more likely to see a two spot bumblebee than in July. And if you're looking in August, you're not gonna see a two spot bumblebee probably. You might see a male, but they're very uncommon by the time you get to August. And in fact, by the time you get to August in, in my part of the, the world and in, in Ohio, it was almost all common Eastern bumblebee. So the time of season, makes a really big difference. June and July are really peak seasons in this area for seeing the greatest diversity of bumblebees. We also found that where you look is very important. So this is a map of Ohio showing for four of our different species. We've got the um, golden Northern bumblebee and you can see this one is sort of distributed um, throughout Ohio in terms of the North South gradient, but you're, it's really, missing from Western Ohio up in the agricultural areas of Western Northwestern Ohio, as is the confusing bumblebee. In fact, the confusing bumblebee is really centered around Northeastern Ohio. We didn't get very many of these um, in Western Ohio at all. And there are some down here in the forest, but very few. We're looking at all these blue spots. Um, the half black bumblebee also tends to be somewhat associated with these more forested or green areas of Ohio. We don't tend to see a lot of it out in uh, northeastern Ohio and these agricultural plains. And you can contrast that with the, this graph shows both um, the golden, uh, sorry, the black and gold bumblebee and the uh, American bumblebee. And you can see they're a little bit more broadly distributed in the, in the sort of flatter um, agricultural plains areas and a little bit less in the Southern uh, forests of Ohio. So we were able to 
get a little bit better idea of how these are using the landscapes of Ohio. We're interested for both queens and workers and what kind of habitat they use. Um, so this is a uh, result of a one year um, nest searching queen survey. We were looking for queens that were cruising along the ground searching for nests starting in April and May. And I have a few of the videos from that, um, from that study that Denise uploaded to the website. So you can see what queens look like when they're nest searching. It's a very characteristic behavior of flying low to the ground, stopping, digging in some leaf litter, getting back out, flying again. Um, so we looked at two things. We looked at what habitat were they in when we saw them, whether it was sort of a maintained grasses, uh, woodland edges in the middle of a forest, in fields and wetlands. And you can see there were, we found a fair number across all of these habitats, although slightly more sort of in the edges and maintained areas than we did in sort of fields and wetlands. And many of these queens were the common Eastern bumblebee, which makes sense. They don't tend to nest quite as much, I think, in fields as they do in sort of forest edges. The other thing we were interested in is sort of the locations where we saw them stop investigating what sorts of habitat features were right in there. And we call that the micro habitat, that sort of little area right investigating a possible nest. And we found that things like leaf litter and wood and um, sort of herbaceous layers were pretty important, but other things like grass clumps, ponds, uh, bare ground and rock piles were not very important. Um, and Although these were similar across the three species that we had enough data to assess, so these are the, the big three, the common eastern, the brown belt, and the two spot, there were some slight differences. So for instance, um, the brown belted bumblebee was more likely to be um, associated or looking for a nest in a grass clump. And we do tend to sometimes see them nesting above ground in things like sedge tussocks or bunch grasses. We looked at habitat preferences of the workers. So this is a graph showing um, where workers reach their maximum abundance uh, for all of our different species. So here on the left, I have our more slightly more common species. And one of the takeaways of this is that although each of the species has a slightly different um, sort of habitat preference or seems to do best in different habitats, these planted habitats tended to be the places where we saw most of them. So roadsides, planted urban areas, and planted hay fields were very common compared to roadsides, shrubby areas, and just natural fields. On the right, we have some of the rarer species. So this was the Golden Northern, the Confusing, the American Bumblebee, and the Black and Gold Bumblebee. And what I also take away from this is that for many of these, these planted habitats were quite important, but we have a little bit more variation, right? So each of these seems to be kind of coming to its highest abundance in different types of habitats. And I think these can be very useful as we look into habitat conservation. And then the last slide I'll show you is, um, the results of a landscape analysis we did. So here we're looking at sort of a broader landscape perspective. So it's a two meter radius from the sites where we found these bumblebees. And we're just looking here at the probability of occurrence of some of our rarer species. And these are, um, I, I, sorry that I put all the Latin names in here. This is from a, a publication, but I can translate them. So where we see as a proportion of forest in the landscape increases, we see that the um, Bombus vegans, our half black bumblebee, get, is a lot more likely to be found in these more forested landscapes, um, as is to some degree the um, golden northern bumblebee and the confusing bumblebee. But the, the um, black and gold, and especially the American bumblebee, are not associated with forest. And in fact, the American bumblebee tends to be negatively associated with forest. Um, so, 
the result of looking at 24,000 specimens is that we can actually get a little bit better idea at the species level of how these bees are using habitat and landscapes. And hopefully it can help us to think about some areas um, you know, sort of going forward what we need for conservation. Okay, so thank you so much for your attention. I, I think I have a few minutes to answer questions. Hey, Karen, thank you so much. Uh, folks, I put the link to the post test in the chat box. So you can click on that if you want to go ahead and um, give it a try for the post test. Uh, Karen, if um, on the Q&A box, if you click on um, your little box, you can either say most recent or most upvote. So if you want to click on that, um, that, that'll be the best way to see questions if you want to look through there and see which ones you want to field. Okay, I've, I've clicked most upvotes and now I'm going scrolling to the top. Oh, there's so many questions here. Just right, yeah. So the, the top one is how many queens might come from a typical nest per year? And I know you and Jesse did some awesome research about that. Yeah, so my, my graduate student Je and former postdoc, Jesse Novotny or Jesse Lanterman, um, actually counted the reproductive success of, of bumblebee colonies that she had placed out on reclaimed mines. And she got anywhere from zero queens to over 200. And uh, so there's a lot of variation. So, and I don't think this is very unusual for bumblebees that we, we can see some of them do very, very well and some of them just really tank. Let's see, you kind of answered the one that looked at different habitats for bumblebees. Do you, um, so we'll uh, ask if there's a wall chart or a poster for bumblebees. Yes, um, there is, and um, I don't have the link handy right now, but I can certainly send it to, to yep. Denise and I'll pass get it that up. Super. Um, can one species of bumbles mate with others and produce hybrids? I don't know of examples of that, but at least from the ones that I'm talking about, um, I'm not familiar with that. Hybridization in animals is, is a little rarer than in plants, I know. And maybe some of my the other people on in this course would correct me on that if I'm wrong, but I, I don't know of any examples of that. What's the best habitat to look for the rusty patch? Well, I'm gonna be doing that this summer. I would start by going to the Fish and Wildlife Service website and looking at the distributions of maps where it has been found. Um, I'll be looking in Virginia and West Virginia up in the mountains and apparently areas where there's a lot of landscape heterogeneity sort of aspect and slope differences and little patches of open areas in forest. I think that's where I'm gonna focus my, um, my attention. I don't know if I'll be successful. I know that if you're in Minnesota, you might find them flying around in open fields or near forest edges um, where there are flowers. And again, I would say June and July is probably a good time to look for them because you won't be in danger of damaging any queens by then probably. And you'll be getting the point where the workers are really building up over this, you know, if you get a colony that'll have more workers, you'll be more likely to see them. Um, I've seen some bumblebees flying around low to the ground and even hovering in certain spots. Is that queen behavior? Yes, that is queen behavior. Um, so they're looking for a nest. Um, collecting bumblebees. So I mentioned collecting bumblebees. Do you catch and release? How careful does one have to be? Um, you can catch and release bumblebees. You can put them in a jar and um, photograph them and let them go. I think that as long as you're not clipping off their legs in the edge of the jar or leaving them in there too long, I think that's probably all right. Karen, uh, does, does that change if, if you're in the, like with the rusty patch bumblebee? I was thinking Tam last week talked about um, that you're not allowed to, to gather molest. Uh... Right, that, that would definitely, the rusty patch bumblebee, you'd probably, you do not want to pick that up. Do, you know, photograph it, please or document it, let someone know you see it, but yeah, do not catch that one. Um, if you catch it inadvertently, I would let it go as quickly as possible without damaging it um, because that, that you can get into some trouble for doing that. 
um, with a federally endangered species. You know, that said, unless you're really in an area where they're common, you it probably won't be a species you would be likely to collect. I'll put the post uh, test link back in there. It's down at the bottom. Roseanne got a 10 out of 10. Way to go, Roseanne. Ooh, all right. <laughs> That's a name I, I recognize. I've maybe been to a few bee workshops. Um, is climate, oh, so I think I answered the climate change impact one. So, um, what best materials landscape arrangements helps offer the most option for them to nest? Great question. There's a lot of information on the web about putting out like flower pots or little boxes or things. But I think um, bumblebees tend to nest in rodent burrows and um, maybe even be attracted to mouse poop and the sort of stuff that you would find in a mouse nest. So I've actually thought of trying to make some little boxes or even sort of flower pot, um, clay flower pot things and putting mouse stuff in there like from a mouse nest and see if I can get the bees attracted to it. That where you have good uh, rodent populations, you might have good bumblebee populations. Great. Well, awesome. Thank you, Karen, for this wonderful overview of some of our Eastern uh, species of bumblebees in North America. Folks, a lot of you have put a thank you into the chat box. Thank you for doing that. Um, if you haven't done the post test, go ahead and do that to see how your uh, knowledge has increased. And if you're coming back for the Western ID, you're welcome to stay online. You don't have to log back in. It's the same link to log in. So you can just come back at the top of the hour. Um, Karen, are you okay for a few minutes? Do you have a few minutes to, to spend with us? So guys, if you, uh, Karen, do you think you could go through the quiz and just, uh, you know, just take five minutes max, maybe and just walk through the questions and tell people how they might know um, to identify all those, those bees in the quiz? Yeah, let me, let me pull that up. Um, Great, super. So hang on if you want to go through the quiz. Uh, come back if you're going to stick with us for Lincoln Best uh, session on Western Bumble ID. Um, if you're heading off, thanks everybody for joining us. Hope to see you next week with Randy Mitchell for uh, Bumblebee Botany, which will be wonderful. I'm going to open the one that hasn't been. Okay. So should I just share my screen again? Sure. We hadn't really planned on doing that, Karen, but somebody suggested <laughs> okay. it. I thought, well, that's a great idea. Let's, uh, if you have uh, the time. working on my tiny laptop here. So <laughs> can, can you guys all see this? Yep. Okay. Okay, what bee is this? Um, uh, this, so this, you see, I didn't put bumblebee and that's a hint. If you look at the head of this bee, super wide, right? Almost as wide as its thorax. Um, this is a lotus corniculatus flower, I believe. It's a kind of small plant. So it's a relatively smallish bee, but this is um, an Osmia mason bee. So if you go down here, um, this would be not a bumblebee, other kind of bee. So that's your Osmia bucephala, the buffle headed mason bee. Uh, I, you know, they really look like bumblebees, um, but they're not. Uh, here's a, a, a bumblebee. You'll notice this one has a single abdominal segment of yellow. It's not the greatest picture for identification because you can't see what's going on up here. Um, but choices should be pretty clear. Common Eastern has one abdominal segment of yellow, so that's the correct answer. Um, the lemon cuckoo bee would probably have yellow elsewhere on the abdomen or be a little bit shinier on the abdomen. Um, the brown belted would have something going on in the second abdominal segment, like a, a rusty brown patch. And the half black would have two abdominal segments that were yellow, and this one only has one. So the best answer here is common Eastern. Uh, here we've got a really fab, I love this picture. Um, you can see that little half moon of, of brown pile here, and beyond that is black. So you might get excited that this is a rusty patch bumblebee, but no, it's, it's just the brown belted bumblebee. So that would be brown belted. The rusty patch would have yellow below it. And it's not the tricolored, although it does have three colors because tricolored would have two bright orange segments and then another yellow segment. 
Uh, here we've got our um, Bombus fervidus, the yellow bumblebee. And I could have made this harder by giving you some choices that had other bumblebees with a lot of yellow, like the Bombus borealis, but I didn't make it that hard. Um, so you can see those four yellow segments um, are very typical of the Bombus fervidus and that black bar between the wing bases. And it's visiting crimson clover, which has deep flowers and it's got a long tongue. Uh, another gorgeous picture of a bumblebee with showing the two spots. This is your Bombus binaculatus, your two spot bumblebee. Um, it's really the only species that's got that distinctive pattern. Um, it's, and you can see it's got pollen baskets, so you know it's a bee, so it's not a bee mimic. Um, this one, uh, well, Hopefully you can recognize this one. This is your rusty patch bumblebee, corbiculi, full of pollen. There's the rusty patch with yellow below it and yellow above it. So that's the rusty patch bumblebee. Uh, the tricolored would have two full orange segments and then yellow below. And red belted would also have yellow below, but it would have, um, the rusty patch would be down on, on T3, not on T2. This one's kind of hard. Uh, this you might think maybe is a Bombus perplexus, um, but you see this big black spot. So that Bombus perplexus tends not to have that big black spot. So this is the half black bumblebee with the two yellow abdominal segments. And I, yeah, so I, I did have, ask if it was Bombus perplexus, but that's how you would distinguish it from that. And I think it's pretty obviously not a rusty patch and it's pretty obviously not the um, common Eastern. Oh, this one's a really hard one. So if you, if, you, if you guessed either American bumblebee or golden Northern, you did really, or, I mean, sorry, American bumblebee or black and gold bumblebee, you did very well. Um, you can see, tiny little um, yellow eyebrows right there. That's really the main indication that what you're looking at is um, the golden northern bumblebee and not the American bumblebee. So that was a very hard one. And here's our beautiful, beautiful, let's see what the choices are here. Yeah, so not the rusty patch because too much orange in the wrong place. And the, the red belted bumblebee um, would have a, a, a smaller bit of red here, just one segment of red typically. And this one here, um, this one should be, I might have gotten these mixed up. This one I think is Bombus oricomus. This one has um, a little bit of yellow up here. So actually, I may have made a mistake in mine here because this one is pretty clearly Bombus oricomus. Um, it's got the, the yellow down here on the thorax and the yellow up here. So I'm going to call that black and gold bumblebee. And I'm going to go back up here and correct mine because now that I've seen it, I think this is my copy of the American bumblebee. And maybe that what I'm looking at there that I thought was the little bit of yellow pile is just a reflection. I told you those were really hard. I often get out my hand lens and look at these in the field to just look at their faces to make sure I'm really looking at it uh, in the right way. Okay, so I guess I got nine out of 10. <laughs> well, it's helpful for those of us who don't do this all the time um, to just to see how hard it is for those of you who are experts in it. I mean, they're really challenging, especially on the fly in the field um, yes. on the flower. Really, uh, really challenging. Yeah, there's no there's a really use, using experts. If you see something that you think is really interesting, I mean, I use I send it to colleagues to to make sure I'm really doing it right. Um, and we, we do a little bit of um collection, you know, destructive collection so that we can get vouchers and really look at them under the microscope. But yeah, bumblebee identification is, is really tough. On the other hand, a lot of these species are pretty rare. So hopefully the common things 
um, you've gotten a good idea about. 